everybody and welcome to another deep dive today we are looking at a really uh a really interesting topic it's something that kind of hits at uh i think a lot of different things that are important these days um and that is celebrity authors specifically celebrity authors writing children's books and even more specifically than that we're going to be looking at a particular case jamie oliver the chef wrote a children's book a sequel actually called Billy and the Epic Escape. Now, it's a sequel to an earlier book called um, Billy and the Giant Adventure. So if you're not familiar with those books, the basic premise is it's about this group of kids and they're going on these summer adventures. Sounds pretty harmless, right? Well, one of the characters in uh, Billy and the Epic Escape, a girl named Ruby, who is a First Nations girl. That's the term used for the indigenous peoples of Australia. Uh, she's depicted as having these kind of mystical powers. And that's where things get a little bit dicey. Because all of his portrayal of Ruby and these mystical powers has really sparked a lot of controversy. People are accusing him of being culturally insensitive, of relying on some harmful stereotypes. And so what we want to do today is unpack all that, look at the criticisms that have been leveled against the book, and then explore, I think, some bigger questions that this whole situation raises about representation and responsibility in children's literature. Yeah, I think that's a great place to start you know, really diving into those criticisms. Because I think it's important to understand exactly what people are objecting to and why they feel it's so problematic. So when we look at the portrayal of Ruby and these so-called mystical powers, the concern isn't simply that it simplifies complex indigenous beliefs, you know, reducing them to something like a magic trick. It's that this simplification feeds into a larger stereotype. This idea that indigenous cultures are somehow inherently mystical or magical. And that stereotype is harmful because it flattens the rich diversity of First Nations cultures into this single monolithic image. It's kind of like saying, you know, all Asian cultures are the same because they use chopsticks. Right. It erases the unique traditions and beliefs of individual communities, and it prevents us from really appreciating the complexity and nuance of those cultures. So that's one of the major criticisms. But there's another element of the book that has really sparked a lot of outrage, and that's the chapter titled To Steal a Child. In this chapter, Ruby is actually abducted, and crit critics have pointed out that this fictional event, it echoes the very real and traumatic history of the stolen generations in Australia, which was this period when indigenous children were forcibly removed from their families by the government as part of this policy of assimilation. So to include a fictional abduction in this context, without proper consultation or sensitivity towards the trauma of the stolen generations, was seen as incredibly insensitive and disrespectful. It's almost like writing a children's book about a playful kidnapping, but setting it against the backdrop of the Holocaust, you know, it just completely misses the mark in terms of cultural sensitivity and understanding. Yeah, it sounds like the use of the stolen generations as a plot device in the book is particularly problematic. And I think it's important for our listeners to understand the historical context here. So the stolen generations refers to this period in Australian history that spanned from the late 19th century to the 1970s. And during this time, the Australian government systematically removed indigenous children from their families. And the stated goal of this policy was to assimilate these children into white society, to strip them of their language, their culture, their connection to their communities. And this policy had absolutely devastating and long lasting impacts on indigenous communities. It caused immense suffering, broke down family structures and led to this intergenerational trauma that continues to this day. So you can see why using this incredibly sensitive and painful historical event hmm. as a plot point in a children's book without proper care and understanding would spark so much outrage. It's like you're almost making light of a very serious and traumatic issue. Right, and what makes this whole situation even more complicated is that it also exposes some issues within the publishing process itself. So Jamie Oliver has said that he initially requested indigenous consultation during the development of the book, but there was what Penguin Random House, the publisher, called an editorial oversight. That ultimately prevented any meaningful involvement of indigenous voices and this failure to consult with indigenous communities, especially when dealing with such a sensitive cultural narrative really highlights a significant gap in editorial responsibility. Now, to their credit, Penguin Random House has acknowledged that their publishing standards fell short in this instance, and they've expressed their commitment to learning from this mistake. But I think what makes this situation even more complex is that it's not an isolated incident. We're actually seeing a growing trend of celebrity authors entering the world of children's literature. You know, we have Millie Bobby Brown, Keira Knightley, even Meghan Markle all have published children's books. And while their intentions may be good, this trend raises some questions about whether the allure of a celebrity name might sometimes overshadow the need for thorough editorial scrutiny, especially when it comes to representing diverse cultures and sensitive historical events. That is a really fascinating point. 
Because on the one hand, it's great that these celebrities are using their platform to promote literacy and encourage kids to read. But as we've seen with the Jamie Oliver situation, there's a real risk that the star power of the author might eclipse the need for that rigorous editorial oversight. And it does make you wonder, are publishers applying the same level of scrutiny to manuscripts from celebrity authors as they would to those from lesser known writers? And if not, what are the potential consequences? Especially when it comes to representing marginalized communities. It's a big question and it's one I think the publishing industry really needs to be having a serious conversation about. So where do we go from here? I mean, what happens after a controversy like this erupts? Well, in Jamie Oliver's case, he, he issued a pretty quick apology. You know, he, he acknowledged that the portrayal of Ruby had caused offense and expressed regret for, you know, the missteps that were made. But while the apology was welcomed by some, it didn't really erase those concerns about the perpetuation of harmful stereotypes and that lack of proper indigenous consultation during the creation of the book. And I think what's particularly interesting is the response from indigenous authors and advocates, because for some of them, the recall of Billy and the epic escape was seen as a potential turning point. Shira Levy, for example, she's a prominent Kuma and Gori children's book author. She viewed it not just as a corrective measure, but as a sign that maybe the publishing industry is starting to take cultural sensitivity and authentic representation more seriously. So there's this hope that this incident will lead to more meaningful collaborations with First Nations communities, ensuring that their stories are told with respect and accuracy, not through this lens of stereotypes or misinterpretations. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. It's not just about you know avoiding offense. It's about really engaging in a deeper understanding of different cultures recognizing their complexities and ensuring that their stories are told with the respect and authenticity that they deserve. And that applies not just to children's literature, but to all forms of media that we consume and create. And it really highlights the power that we have as consumers to hold creators and publishers accountable for the stories that they're putting out into the world by speaking out against harmful stereotypes and demanding more authentic representation. We can actually help shape a media landscape that's more inclusive and respectful of diverse cultures and experiences. So this whole incident with Jamie Oliver's book, mm -hmm. while controversial, it offers, I think, a valuable learning opportunity for all of us. Absolutely. And you know, it forces us to confront this bigger question of whose stories get told and who gets to tell them. You know, for far too long, marginalized communities have been spoken for, their narratives shaped by those outside their culture, and that often leads to misrepresentation, the perpetuation of harmful stereotypes and the erasure of those authentic voices. What we need is a fundamental shift in the way we approach storytelling. You know, we need to move beyond token representation and strive for genuine inclusivity. That means creating space for diverse voices to tell their own stories, making sure that their perspectives and experiences are at the forefront. And it also means being mindful of the power dynamics at play, you know, recognizing that those with privilege and platforms have a responsibility to use them to amplify marginalized voices, not speak over them. Yeah, that's such a crucial point. Recognizing that responsibility that comes with having a platform, you know, whether you're a celebrity chef or a best-selling author, or even just someone with a social media account, you have this power to influence how people see the world. And with that power comes a responsibility to be mindful to educate yourself and to use your voice to advocate for a more just and equitable world. And it's not about being politically correct. It's about recognizing the humanity of all people mm -hmm. and ensuring that everyone has the opportunity to see themselves reflected in the stories we tell and the media we consume. It's about creating a world where difference is celebrated, not feared, and where everyone feels seen, heard, and valued. So as we wrap up our deep dives into this, uh, this whole controversy with Jamie Oliver's book, it really does make you think about the power of stories, right? And the importance of cultural sensitivity when we're telling those stories, especially when we're dealing with cultures and histories that are different from our own. Yeah, and I think this whole situation is a really powerful reminder that cultural sensitivity isn't just a box to tick off, it's an ongoing process, you know? Mm -hmm. It's about learning, listening, engaging with diverse perspectives, recognizing that we all have these blind spots and biases, and being open to feedback, acknowledging when we've made mistakes and being willing to do better. And you know, it also highlights the need for greater collaboration and partnership with marginalized communities. It's about, you know, instead of assuming we know what's best for them, we need to create spaces where their voices can be heard and their stories can be told authentically in their own words. And it makes you wonder, how can we move beyond this kind of surface level inclusion to a place where cultural respect and authentic representation are like woven into the very fabric of our storytelling? That's a really powerful question. And it's a challenge, I think, for all of us as consumers, as creators, and just as members of this global society to think critically about the stories we tell.
and the impact that they have. It's about moving beyond simply avoiding offense and striving to create a world where everyone feels seen, heard, and respected. So thank you all for joining us on this deep dive. We hope it's given you some things to think about and maybe even inspired you to take action in your own life. Keep learning, keep questioning, and keep the conversation going.